the mm -hmm. Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Welcome to the seminar. So today is our pleasure to have Dr. Sonata Yao to share her research findings with you guys. So uh, before we start, uh, just have a little bit of uh, regulations for this seminar. Okay, if you have any questions related to the presentation, you can either leave the message or questions in the chat, or you can actually leave the questions at the end of this presentation. And after the presentation, you will be given time and opportunity to ask questions directly to Dr. Samantha Yang. Okay. Uh, we are also welcome that you can switch on your microphone or video cam to, to ask your questions at the end of this presentation. So let me have some very brief introductions to uh, Dr. Sonata Yao. Um, Dr. Yao completed her bachelor degree in biochemistry at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology in 2005 and her PhD degree in neuroscience in Department of Anatomy, the University of Hong Kong in 2009. Before she joined PolyU, she received a postdoctoral fellowship at the, uh, Hong Kong U between 2009 and 2000, 2012, followed by another postdoctoral fellowship in the Division of Medical Sciences at the University of Victoria, British Columbia in Canada in 2012. She is particularly interested in using different disease mo animal models to investigate the effects of non-pharmacological and pharmacological interventions on promoting health, uh, promoting brain plasticity. Her current research projects are centered on the hippocampus, a brain regions important for learning and memory. She investigated uh, the underlying mechanisms of physical exercise induced hippocampal plasticity in disease uh, animal models, including uh, depression and mental retardation, and identifying its related biomarkers for translational research in humans. She also investigates uh, changes in uh, hippocampal plasticity, underlying cognitive impairment and therapeutic treatments and mental retardation. She uses a number of research techniques to assess hippocampal structure and function, such as uh, behavioral analysis, electrophysiology, immunohistochemistry, uh, and also uh, Western uh, blood analysis. So please welcome Dr. Edson Dial. Thank you so much, Wei, for your kind introductions. Um, and thank you all for attending this lunch seminar. And I even uh, um, thank you so much for our other colleagues from other university. Also, Professor Ko uh, on the screens, uh, who is my undergraduate uh, final year project uh, mentor and also my collaborator now, and also uh, other uh, collaborator from other university. Uh, thank you all. So, um, so as we mentioned, that my lab uh, is focused on studying hippocampal neuroplasticity in a different disease model like depression, diabetes, and autism. So, today I would talk about how um, improving uh, hippocampal plasticity is linked to stress resilience and to contract uh, stress-related disorders. Okay. okay, so stress. So we're all facing different kinds of stress um, from work, from life, uh, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic with social distancing. But we know that that's like inverted U-shape of the, the stress curve, okay? Too little stress lead to lack of motivation, okay? We are inactive in doing things. But too much stress will burn out or even develop anxiety and panic disorders. So what does uh, stress mean to you? So we, why we need stress as a human beings? So we got it small or big, uh, short term or long term. Okay, from these cartoons, you might get the, um, uh, the message that I should trigger the fight and flight responses. Okay, especially for husband who are always forgetful at home. Okay, or also small animal in wildlife for survival. Mm. Okay. So uh, once uh, once we expose to stress, the uh, HP access will be activated. Okay, so this is the stress response that um, the hypothalamus will be activated to secrete the corticotropin-releasing hormone. And this hormone will reach to the pituitary gland. 
which get activated receptors and to release the uh, adrenal corticotrophin hormone that reach to uh, the adrenal gland, okay, and then to secrete the cortisol into the bloodstream. So in turn, elevated cortisol will go to the brain and have a feedback regulation by binding to the glucocortical cortical receptors to stop this stress response. So with the, the, the uh, feedback loop to stop the stress response, so that the actions uh, of the stress response uh, by activating a glucocorticoid corticoid uh, with the genomic effects or non-genomic effect can be uh, stopped once the stressor is gone. However, this regulated HP access is always uh, seen with the depressed patients and is associated with uh, uh, the onset with the chronic uh, stress uh, exposure. It is because the stress can alter our brain, okay, with a biphasic effect by binding to the glucocortical cortical receptors. So at the low level or the right amount of stress, it can enhance synaptic functions, increase neuroplasticity, and also enhance our learning. However, with uh, too much stress, with a chronic uh, elevated uh, cortisol in the blood and also in the brain, it can suppress the synaptic functions and reduce neuroplasticity and even damage the neurons to cause neuronal death. And with the brain aging, so there is a natural process that we have the higher level of the cortisol in our, in our body. So our brain can change for our life. Okay, it means that we can adapt to the environment, okay, with different uh, uh, challenges to refine the neural circuits for survival, for better adjustment. So we call experience dependent plasticity. It means the neurons and synapses in the brain can change the efficacy of their neural uh, connectivity in the persisting neural circuits. So here shows you a single neuron filled by a biocyting uh, by myself in the lab. So it's stained uh, in red color and the dark blue representing uh, one nucleus. So you can see that there's a lot of neurons cluster in you know, one layer. So here, here is the hippocampus in the dentate uh, 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 granulosa layer. So this is a confocal image showing you how a single neuron is branched out in 3D structure. They try to branch as much as possible so that you can get in touch with the adjacent neuron to form the synaptic connection. So um, a single neuron actually looks like a, a tree with the, the base we have the trunk and then the branching. So we call it into the tree. If you have a closer look at one segment, you can see there's a, a lot of little things we call spine. The spine is where the synapse can be formed. The neurons can be um, uh, propagated electrical signal from one neuron to other neurons. So this is how they form the connections. So during the development, so from newborn to two years old, you can see it the complexity of the neurons and the network getting more and more complex, okay? However, this process can be declined during aging, okay? So we all want our brain to stay in this shape, but not declined during aging to, to this stage for the infant stage, right? So the healthy brain cell actually through light. Okay, they light all the neurons sitting in their brain, they light all the trees sitting in the forest. They need a lot of nutrients like sunlight and water to grow healthy. Okay, here's those cortical neurons uh, and the cortical layers. And the neurons that are connected together, okay, they're firing in different patterns, depends on uh, which circuit, which uh, neural circuit they are, they are on. Neurons connect together, they fire together. Okay, here shows you uh, in animal um, brain, in the live animal, the in vivo calcium imaging of a neuronal fire in the, uh, in the mouse cortex. The neurons fire beautifully at different time points, uh, like a firework in our brain. So the healthy neurons look like a healthy tree, but with uncontrollable stress, unhealthy diet or alcohol, the neurons become sick. Okay, it means it lost the dendrites, lost the spines, it lost the circuitry, lost the neuronal connection to the adjacent neurons so that the information cannot be processed. But this 
degenerated neurons can be rescued by physical exercise, healthy diet, and other drug treatments, and also including traditional Chinese medicines. Okay, doing the right thing can regenerate the degenerative neurons, can regain the connections again. So I will focus on hippocampus because it's an important region for learning and memory and emotion regulations. And the hippocampus is named because it's shaped it's looked like a seahorse, okay, in the Greek word. So here shows you the, uh, the human hippocampus and here shows you the mouse hippocampus with both hemisphere. And this is the uh, in situ hybridization showing the mRNA expression of the Google cortical receptors in the hippocampus. So the hippocampus have a very high level of Google cortical receptors. That's why it's very susceptible to the stress uh, effect. And animal studies already showed uh, that chronic exposure uh, to, to psychological stress or physical stress can reduce the dendritic uh, complexity, the dendritic blunting and length of the uh, neurons in the hippocampus. And also if uh, in the animal model, if introduced corticosteroid continuously for five weeks, uh, corticosteroid is the major stress hormone in rodents. It can induce similar dendritic atrophy to uh, stress exposure, okay, in terms of decreasing dendritic branch and also total dendritic length. And this atrophy can be restored by antidepressant treatment. And a human study it shows that hippocampal volume uh, shrink, okay, decrease in untreated depressed patients. And there's a significant inverse relationship between the hippocampal total volume, so the length of the time of depression when untreated. It means hippocampus actually affected in a depressed patient. So it's because the hippocampus have a very high neuroplasticity. Okay. So the synaptic plasticity can be changed. It means the synaptic strengthening or weakening uh, uh, can be changed for our life. And also dendritic morphology, the branching, the length, and also spike density can be modified by different stimuli. And also there's a feature in hippocampus, which is a newborn cells in our adult brain. We all have a newborn cell are generated every day in the hippocampus. That's important for learning and memory. So hippocampal volume shrinkage actually also happened, uh, happened when you age 50. Not only in depressed patient, but in healthy uh, adult, they have the uh, hippocampal shrinkage uh, one to 2% every year. Okay, don't be panic. Okay, if you reach age 50, there's something you can be re re restored. Okay, to prevent, okay? So it can be due to dendritic organization reduction, neuronal death, uh, a re a reduction in neuronal circuitry, uh, connection, and also spine density, and also uh, reduce in adult neurogenesis. Here's a human study showing that um, the hippocampal volume loss in, a, in the age group for with one year follow-up, but with aerobic exercise working program for a year, you can see that the hippocampal volume loss can be prevented in the exercise group, but not in the control stretching group. And this exercise effect is very specific to the hippocampus, and it, it was not found in the cordial nucleus or thalamus. So the studies uh, conclude uh, that the exercise training actually can increase hippocampal volume by 2%, okay? which means that it can effectively reverse age-related loss in uh, volume by one to two years. That that's means a lot, so one to two years. Okay. Another study also saw that aerobic fitness actually is uh, associated with uh, volume, uh, hippocampal volume in elderly humans. And then bigger hippocampal volumes could be uh, a contributor, a mediator for better uh, spatial learning and memory in, in the age uh, populations. And physical exercise actually is a very good antidepressant. It has a better therapeutic effect than medications, in fact. So this study compared the exercise effect and the medication and antidepressant effect or in combination. What they found is with exercise training three times per week with 30 minutes. Okay, uh, exercise 
group has highest recovery rate, lowest relapse rate compared to the medications alone or in combination. Okay. Um, there's always problem with current antidepressant treatments because of delayed onset of therapeutic effects. It requires two weeks, at least two weeks to see their uh, treatment effect and a low response rate. More than 20% of patients did not respond to any currently available uh, antidepressants. And the efficacy is quite low, okay, with the high relapse weight. So therefore, there are, new, there are urgent need for new antidepressant uh, uh, treatment. However, physical exercise, although it is the most potent uh, uh, non-pharmacological treatment, is always underutilized. Okay, we all know that physical exercise is good. More physical exercise can prevent neurodegenerative disorders, or neuro uh, psychiatric uh, psychiatric uh, disorders. Uh, physical exercise is a promising intervention. Can influence a lot of endo endogenous pharmacology to enhance cognition and emotional uh, 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 functions, even in late adulthood. It means the 80s or 90 years old. Okay. However, we still don't know how exercise works, how it promotes brain function with, with, with muscle contraction when doing the exercise. So this is why I focus on hippocampus because as I mentioned, we have around 700 new bond neurons every day generated in our brain. However, the new 80% of them will die if we don't use that, okay? Physical exercises are still a strong stimulus Okay, here shows you in a mouse hippocampus, in the granule cell layer and the dentate gyrus, there are some uh, a cluster of newborn neurons generated. So those are the newborn neurons uh, in the dentate gyrus labeled with the green fluorescent protein. So in, in animal model, we can visualize it with uh, immunostaining with the antibody called KS7, it's a polyvalent cells. It's a nucleus thing like this, and also immature uh, marker, um, double quartins. So those things are done by my student in, in the lab at PolyU. So we can visualize and quantify the number of the newborn neurons in the hippocampus. And here shows you the uh, human hippocampus uh, uh, with uh, uh, newborn neurons, the double quartin uh, positive staining. Okay, so why we mention neurogenesis because it's very important for hippocampal dependent learning and memory and the neurogenesis mediates some of the uh, therapeutic effect of antidepressants and also the physical exercise uh, effect on depression. And neurogenesis is known, to, is involved in regulating HP access and response to stress and also a response for some form of the memory and also important for increasing stress resilience. But that's why keeping neurogenesis is important for your learning and memory. Okay, so accumulated animal studies, so already shown that physical exercise can promote hippocampal structural synaptic plasticity, including increasing neurogenesis uh, and also increasing uh, dendritic plasticity and spike density by Brian Christie Labs, who is my um, uh, supervisor when I was doing my postdoc in um, uh, Canada. And also the first study shown that exercise can increase synaptic plasticity in the hippocampal dendritic gyrus by our Dr. Van Plack and also together with Brian Christie, who are my collaborators as well. So these effects can be mediated by increase in neurotrophin factors, like, uh, like brain derived neurotrophin factors, BDNF, uh, insulin like growth factor, and also vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF. So my previous work using animal model depressions are induced by chronic uh, corticosteroid administration. Uh, have uh, proved that uh, using voluntary running as an exercise paradigm, okay? These depressed rats, after exercise, they showed uh, increase in neurogenesis, increase in dental length, branch, spine density in uh, dentigyrus and CFE subregion of the hippocampus. And this uh, effect is associated with increase in hippocampal BDNF levels. So here shows you from one of the, the data I, I, I have. So we inject 40 milligram per kilogram of cortical steroid to, to induce depression in the rat. And I subject the, the rat to runnings 
what we see is in, in the run runner groups, okay, depressed run runner runners, they show decrease in dendritic length and also decrease in spine density, uh, which can be restored by doing the exercise. And also not only hippocampus, okay, medial prefrontal cortex is another important brain area for mood regulation and also our executive functions. And uh, this area is severely affected by depression and by stress. So uh, voluntary running can also increase the spike density and also synaptic proteins, uh, PS95 synaptic proteins in the, in the prefrontal cortex. So in the exercise actually have a, uh, a significant effect on the brain, key brain areas involved in emotion regulation. However, we are facing not only COVID-19 pandemic, but also global inactivity. Okay, so it seems from these figures, most of developed countries, people have a sedentary lifestyle. Okay, we are facing another pandemic as a physical inactivity pandemic. I'm not going to uh, stress you uh, too much with all those pandemic, but trying to provide some uh, uh, solution to tackle it. Okay. So um, physical inactivity actually is the fourth leading risk factor for global mortality. Okay, we have to really treat this um, a problem, health problem as a serious uh, health problem that can give us a big health burden in coming futures. I'm sure some of the audience might look like this guy, okay, not enjoying doing exercise at all, or some lucky guy you have someone to help you to do, do some exercise at home um, occasionally. But you might be um, excited if there's an exercise pill available. Okay, if you can improve physical uh, inactivity, reducing it by 25%, actually we can prevent more than 1 million cases of dementia worldwide. Okay, so if you're looking for exercise pill, can it be possible? Okay, we're asking the question, can the effects of physical exercise be trackable? So exercise actually is a poly pill because just are so many factors can be stimulated in response to uh, uh, exercise. And so many factors will be secret from muscles, from the brain, from all the organs, okay? All the um, hormones secreted by the muscles in response to exercise, we call myokines, including neurotrophic factors, okay? And also uh, beating enough. And also some uh, uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-10, IL-1, TNF, alpha, and also the uh, hormone-like factor like insulin, fibroblast growth factor 21, VEGF. Uh, that, uh, there's a lot more uh, factors that still not discovered in response to the exercise. Okay, so so far what we know about exercise in fact is. Uh, after you exercise, your brain responds to secrete EDNF. Your liver responds to, to secrete uh, IGF-1 and, and regulate FGF-21 uh, levels. And the fats are also secrete a hormone uh, like adiponectin. And muscle cells secrete a lot of uh, hormone like capsin B, irisin, uh, interleukin-6, 15, and the bones also respond. Okay. We regulate the osteoclausins. All these hormones we already know they can directly regulate the brain neuroplasticity that contribute to improvement in cognition and uh, mood uh, regulations. I start looking at the adiponectin, okay, in the previous uh, experiment in the, in the exercise rat uh, that show uh, enhanced neurogenesis, okay, and this rat also show increase in adiponectin. So I start looking at the bonactin. Okay, it is a factor secret hormone. It can bind to receptor one or receptor two, and other uh, or another uh, tick coherent uh, receptors. So most commonly is one receptor one and two. They can bind to uh, receptor in the adipo tissues, increase glucose utilization, and um, reduce inflammation, and also the muscle cells to increase fatty acid oxidation. So this is. Adiponectin is a metabolic hormone. Okay, it circulates as different form, 
low molecular weight or high molecular weight forms. Uh, mainly trimeric form and globular form and low molecular weight that can pass through blood-brain barrier. They can uh, directly act on the brain. So adiponectin mimic many metabolic effects of exercise. Okay, in a normal healthy individual, uh, they have very high level of adiponectin. So adiponectin actually is the most abundant plasma protein in our body. Okay, but in obese patients, they have to reduce in local adiponectin levels. Okay, which can contribute to metabolic dysfunction and as a result, uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. So using animal models, so uh, so I introduced adiponectin directly into the brain by um, injecting adrenal virus expression adiponectin or a control luciferase. They try to infect the neurons to express adiponectin as they mean to increase the expression. Okay, we wait for 14 days after the uh, injections, so to mimic the uh, running for 14 days. Okay, and then we. Um, Measure the depression like behavior with a common uh, behavioral test, like forced swimming test, tidal suspension test. So, increase in mobility type representing increase in depression. And also, we measure the sucrose buffering test. So, so decrease in sucrose uh, consumption, okay, uh, representing increase in depression behavior. When representing water or 2% of sucrose solution, normally the animal like 2% of sucrose solutions. If they lose interest in consuming 2% of sucrose, it means they have a hedonic-like behavior. Yes, so those are roughly how uh, the animal... Uh, so I think it's not working here. Okay, anyway, I'll skip the... It's not working. So anyway, I'll skip the uh, video. So, so our results shows that um, with increasing adiponectin in the brain direct aid. So the immobility time decrease in suspension tests, forced swimming tests, and also increase sucrose preference tests, okay, representing decrease in, in, in hedonic-like behavior. And also the cell proliferation in hippocampus is increased, as soon by increasing in KS7 positive cell number. And then we um, use the adiponectin local mice. The mice did not show any adiponectin in their body and also in their brain. So in the normal animals with adiponectin present, so after running, they show reduced in depression-like behavior. However, if you're locking down adiponectin, no adiponectin present, even with the exercise, so it abolished the exercise effect, telling that adiponectin is a key mediator. Okay, and then we conduct a series of uh, experiments showing that adiponectin can pass through blood-brain barrier. Okay, and in the hippocampus, we culture the uh, progenitor cell uh, culture, and then we seeing that adiponectin actually can bind to receptor one, but not receptor two. Okay, to activate a certain pathway, an AMP kinase, to 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 uh, stimulate the cell proliferation and increase the uh, neurogenesis as a result. And the consequence lead mediated antidepressant effect of physical exercise. So, um, so far what we know is that adiponectin is a key uh, mediator and it has antidepressant effect. It can directly work on the, the hippocampus to uh, promote uh, neuroplasticity. And in clinical studies also show that Decrease in adiponectin level actually is associated with a uh, severity of the depressive symptoms. The next question is how exercise stimulate uh, adiponectin secretions? Because adiponectin is mainly secreted by the fat cells, but not in the brain, not in other organs. So how muscle contraction during exercise can stimulate the adipocyte to secrete adiponectin still unknown. My collaborators uh, showed uh, that um, a factor called fibroblast growth factor 21, FGF21, it can secrete from the liver, okay? The mediated adiponectin action, uh, adiponectin actually mediates action on regulating glucose homeostasis. 
Okay, that's why we start looking at this factor. Okay, to see whether um, uh, FG attend one from the liver can regulate the adiponectin secretion in response to exercise. Okay, using a similar approach, we have the FGH21 local mice. Because similarly, we're seeing that this is a, a non exercise rat and this is the exercise, uh, 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 sorry, it's mice. So uh, with the exercise, you see increase in hippocampal neogenesis, the newborn cells, and also the immature neurons. However, if you lock down FGH21, there's no such effect. Okay. And then we use another um, uh, experiment if the high fat diet obese uh, animal in the FGH21 local mice, okay, we supplement to, to running, okay. This is the vehicle group as the FGH21 local mice with diabetes, okay. And this group is FGH21 local mice with diabetes and we introduce, we introduce recombinant FGH21, okay? This group of mice, they are with FGH21, okay? So they showed a uh, decrease in, in mobility time and also increase in sucrose preference, okay? So showing that FGH21 actually is required for the antidepressant effect of the physical exercise. And then we'll ask, uh, whether adiponectin is involved in this effect, right? So whether FG one is uh, is uh, upstream of adiponectin or whether it's adiponectin's uh, mediated exercise effect. So what we do is we have the uh, FG attend one local mice in diabetes, and then we introduce we introduce adiponectin. Okay, so here's the 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 mice we found uh, FG, FGF21 and also we found adiponectin, okay? And this one is the mice with FGF21 and with adiponectin uh, uh, treatment. So we're seeing that increase uh, adiponectin in the FGF21 local mice can induce antidepressant effect, okay? So in that adiponectin's actually it's downstream to FGH21. It's required for the FGF21 actions. So with a, a series of experiments, what we showed is after exercise, there's a breaking down of the uh, um, uh, fat, okay? We've increased in free fatty acid in circulation that trigger the liver to secrete FGH21. And FGF21 will bind to the uh, receptor in the adipose tissue to stimulate adipocytes to secret adiponectin into the bloodstream. Adiponectin can go to the hippocampus uh, with the mechanisms like reducing neuroinflammation, increasing neurogenesis, and increasing synaptic plasticity, which can contribute to decrease in depression. So now we know that our uh, adipose tissues, the fat tissues actually is a very important organ involved in all metabolisms. Okay. The emerging theory is that we call uh, terms adipose aging, ad adipose tissue aging. Okay. Actually aging and obesity, they all share common biological changes and that can contribute by the adipose tissue dysfunction. And adipotisu aging is the first sign of human aging. So that's why we focus on the uh, uh, adipotisu aging in the studies. Uh, with the collaboration work <coughs> with uh, Paco Siu uh, from Hong Kong U, uh, uh, pub, uh, School of Public Health, what he found uh, is uh, people with uh, middle uh, obesity and hypertension, or both, they also significant decrease in, in, in adiponectin levels. And what we do is in animals is we will we like to see if um, adipose tissue aging is involved in brain aging. Okay, so we are now in collaborating with uh, Dr. Kenneth Jung from HDI Poly U. 
um, using um, artificial cells senescence model. Okay, we use some um, genetic tools to induce cell senescence in edible tissues. Okay, so and then we we have the mice to examine whether there's an impairment in hippocampal learning and memory, and this work is done by my MPhil student Aha. Uh -huh. So we perform two um, uh, behavior tests. Now for object recognition memory, as we present the object to the mice, a pair of object to the mice for five minutes, and then in testing phase, we introduce one novel object. So normally the mice spend more time on the novel object compared to the familiar object because it's novel, they're more interesting to explore. So all the normal mice, so with the standard diet or with the high fat diet, okay, mimic the uh, uh, diabetic conditions. So the mice, in the normal conditions, they might show more time on exploring the novel object. Okay. However, in the crease, so this is uh, the mice with uh, adipocyte uh, aging. Okay. The, the three mice, so they show impairment. It means that adipose tissues aging actually affect the brain functions. Similar results also saw in hippocampal spatial memory if the assessed by white mice. Okay, in the white maze, we have the releasing arm. Uh, we have two arms open for the mice to freely export. And then in the testing phase, we, we, we have another arm available as a normal arm. So the mice will spend more time on the normal arm compared to the familiar arm, okay, in the normal conditions. So you can see that in, in the, the mice with um, adipotential aging, they show more time, to, uh, they show uh, 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 impairment in the high fat diet, okay, the high fat diet, and also in the standard diet, they show lower ratio, indicating impairment in spatial learning memory. So this uh, pilot data showing that adipose tissue aging actually linked to a hippocampal uh, impairment, the learning memory impairment. So now we're clear about that adiponectin is an uh, uh, important hormone mediating the exercise effect on promoting uh, hippocampal functions, and it could be a potential uh, exercise mimetic uh, hormone. However, we cannot use adiponectin as a uh, repeated treatment, like introducing recombinant protein directly into the, in, into, into the blood, in the human body, because it is the most abundant protein. Okay, it's not feasible. We need a drug treatment that can activate the adiponectin receptors and then activate the dyslexia pathway. Okay, so in 2013, a Japanese group screened over 200 small molecules, and they, they found one that can activate adiponectin receptor one and two, like adiponectin. So it named it as adiproan. So this drug is called adiproan. It can pass through bourbon barrier directly go to the brain and bind to receptor one and receptor two. And, uh, and uh, emerging data already show that it has similar effect as adiponectin. So what we want to do is whether it can be, uh, can work as an exercise mimetic, okay, whether it's, it's a work like uh, exercise. So we have two questions to ask. One is find out the effective dosage, okay? And also to test whether it works like exercise. And this work is done by my uh, student, uh, Thomas, who's also graduated from uh, USC as an uh, undergraduate. So what we find is uh, we have two doses, 20 milligram per kilogram and 50 milligram per kilogram at the prone treatment, continuous for 14 days. Uh, what we find is 20 milligram we call low dosage, increase the serum BDNF levels and also adiponectin levels while the high dose is 50 milligram per kilogram, so opposite effect, okay? So we also saw an impairment in the white maze, indicating that the high doses of the prion impaired uh, 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 hippocampal spatial learning and memory. And this can contribute to reduction in the cell proliferation and also in, a, in, in mature neurons in the hippocampus. And we also found that high doses or overdoses of uh, a, a or a in the brain can induce detrimental effect. 
So this is a work done on collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Lai Guang on uh, uh, Hong Kong U. So we culture the primary neurons and infect the neurons with, with uh, green fluorescent protein so that we can see it in, in the microscope. Uh, and with um, uh, dipronectin and dipronant for one hour, and then to um, an analysis and uh, analyze the, um, I do the morpho spine morphological analysis. So, and this work is done by my another student, Douglas from Brazil. So what we found is, um, a 15 nanomolar adiponectin actually can reduce the mushroom shape of spine. It's a mature spine. This type of spine is a functional spine. They, they form some functional connections. So reduce the uh, uh, functional uh, uh, connection with a high dosage of uh, uh, adiponectin. And also, we also found that uh, adiponectin impaired um, uh, LTP formation in the brain with a high doses of adiponectin in the uh, normal conditions. And this could be due to its actions on blocking the NMDA receptors. NMDA is a glutamate receptors uh, required for uh, the LTP formation in the hippocampus. So um, so far, so we know that uh, 20 milligram per kilogram for IP injections for the adiponectin is beneficial. While if you introduce them too high of the too high, like increasing adiponectin in very high dosage, okay, it can be detrimental. Okay, that's why I start with uh, twenty milligram per kilogram to test whether it may the exercise effect. <coughs> <coughs> so we use a by the diabetic animals. So here's, we have six group of animals, okay? This is the controlled healthy animals without diabetes, with a dipron treatment and exercise, okay? And this is the STC, it's a, it's a drug-induced diabetic model, okay? So diabetes animals show impairment in the, in the Y-Mace, showing that they have an impaired in spatial uh, memory, while a dipron treatment and exercise can restore this impairment. Or similar to, uh, in the hippocampal cell proliferation, okay, in the in the control animal healthy conditions, adiponectin exercise works the same to promote the cell proliferation of the newborn cells. But in the diabetes animals, so the adiponectin exercise can restore the decrease. However, in the number of immature neurons. I did pro and exercise work uh, a bit different. Only exercise can improve um, uh, increased number of newborn cells in the hippocampus in a healthy condition. But in pathological condition, in diabetic conditions, so I did pro and exercise works similarly to restore the decrease. And also, uh, the BDNF level is a very important uh, neutral factor for brain uh, plasticity. So what we found is a deployment exercise in a control condition, in healthy condition, increase uh, BDNF level in the serum, similar level, and also similarly in the in the uh, diabetic conditions. I did I did work like exercise, and I did prone also increase uh, BDNF level in the uh, hippocampus dentate region. Okay, so in summary, in comparing the drug effect and exercise effect, what we found is in a normal condition, a triple wand worked um, uh, on the promoting proliferation and PDF levels, but not like exercise. Okay, exercise can have a more robust effect on the on the in the in the, in the, the brain. But in the pathological conditions, a dipronant effect quite similar to exercise effect, okay? By promoting all the neurogenesis and also improving learning and memory and also increasing BDNF levels. Okay, we also perform a gorgeous staining uh, uh, to see the morphological changes uh, by the dipronant. So this is, this is my first slide for the gorgeous staining when I was doing the PhD students. Okay, well, I was so excited to see this uh, after the, the uh, uh, staining. 
Okay, what we found is a different can effectively restore the dendritic atrophy in the diabetic brains. So this is di 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 diabetes uh, mice. Okay, so decrease in dendritic length and decrease in spine, also decrease in dendritic operation shown in the orange color. However, a deep one treatment can effectively restore all these deficits. And with the electrophysiological recording to measure the synaptic plasticity, we also observe a similar effect. Okay. So here's the diabetic animal, they show no LTP formation. Okay. What with the um, adiprone treatment, it restored to a normal level, the red bar. Okay. Here's the control animal with the LTP. So here's uh, shows you the last five minutes of the LTP measurement. We see in that, so uh, adiprone can restore the impairment in the LTP uh, uh, formation. So um, in summary, so adiprone in a in a pathological condition, it can mimic the exercise effect, not completely, but partially, to restore the decrease in neogenesis, to increase the dendritic complexity, and also restore the synaptic uh, impairment, which can contribute to improve in hippocampal functions. So accumulated evidence shown that adiponectin and adiprons can add on hippocampal or brain uh, plasticity by binding to a receptor one and receptor two. We also saw that adipron can have a more rapid antidepressant effect compared to the conventional uh, antidepressants. Because treatment for four or uh, seven days of, of adipron, okay, can have the therapeutic effect, okay, as shown by uh, behavioral tests like light a box. We, we have the, a box with two compartments, one is a light compartment, the other one is dark compartment. The mice can move from dark to light, light to dark freely. So the, uh, normally mice uh, light uh, stay in the dark if they are anxious. So we do reduce in latency to dark compartment, increasing time spent in, in light box, and also increased number of visits to light box representing decrease in depression like behavior. And also in, in some other um, um, behavior like novel of plus feeding, sucrose puffing test, forced movement test, they all show a therapeutic effect. So we we'll continue our uh, in this story to see how adipron works so quick compared to conventional uh, antidepressants with all these behavioral uh, uh, benefits. Another works we've done is the hippocampal uh, projection to medial prefrontal uh, pathway is involved in the antidepressant effect of ketamine. Okay. So because these two areas, they have the neuronal connections, okay? They're also involved in mood regulations. So there's a pathway from the ventral hippocampus directly project to medial or prefrontal cortex. So what we uh, done is we speculate that uh, a different effect might through regulating the, um, uh, this pathway by increasing synaptic connectivity in this pathway. So we have a chemogenetic uh, approach to activate um, the pathway, the ventral hippocampus and medial prefrontal or cortex pathway. It continues for 14 days <coughs> to mimic the exercise effect. So, so uh, um, as expect, so activating this pathway reduce the immobility time in the phosphorus test, tests, indicating that activating this pathway can elicit antidepressant effect. So this pilot data, and then we would like to see if blocking this pathway can uh, diminish the antidepressant effect of adipron. So we have a seven days of adipron treatment, and also we have uh, uh, um, simultaneously we block the the, the pathway, we block the uh, pathway by chemogenetic approach. What we see is the antidepressant effect of adipron is gone. Okay, there's no decrease in uh, immobility time or increase in sucrose preference in the adiprolon treatment with the chemogenetic inhibition of the ventral hippocampus and medial prefrontal pathway. Uh, this is only a pilot study, so we are still working on, on, on that. Okay, 
just share you with something ongoing in my lab. So um, my animal research aim to identify how physical exercise promote brain health. Hopefully we can identify peripheral biomarkers that can enhance brain uh, plasticity and then lead to drug discovery and also translational uh, uh, research. And then the result can be uh, applied to different uh, psychiatric disorders, neurodegenerative disorders. So, so far what I found is um, physical exercise have a uh, pro-cognitive and antidepressant effect uh, by improving neurogenesis, improving the genetic complexity and also uh, promoting synaptic plasticity. And adiponectin as a key mediators and its receptor agonist adipron could be a potential exercise momentic, although not completely mimicking the exercise effect. Okay, so we are our ongoing work is provide more evidence showing um, adiprolon could be a potential uh, rapid and sustained antidepressants and could be an exercise field for the patient who cannot exercise in the coming future. Okay, so and then after listening to this talk, I got a lot of people asking the question is how much I need to do exercise to promote my brain health. In the past, I cannot give you answers. So now I hope I can give you some hints. Okay, and a more uh, instruction for prescribed exercise as a normal uh, prescription, like resin uh, medicines. Okay, from Lancet recently it published what type of exercise is most effective. So they have the uh, uh, big populations. Okay, they have a whole sample means uh, healthy people together with um, uh, people with uh, periods um, uh, depressed episodes. So in the all exercise group, so we reduce in mental health burden. And also in, 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 the, in the sample with uh, previous uh, depression uh, diagnosis, so uh, decrease. For the whole samples, the popular sports, the team sports, okay? Football, basketball, or cycling, or aerobic gyms has the uh, best effect on reducing health, mental health burden. But for depressed patients, popular sports, cycling, also recreational activities are the most beneficial one. And then how much exercise you need? Okay, they analyze all the exercise time and then look at uh, how uh, duration of the, of the exercise section. Okay, what they found is 45 minutes, almost in all exercise time, have had the most, uh, the best effect on reducing mental health burden. So the conclusion by these uh, studies is the most effective duration will be 45 minutes, five, three to five times a week, okay? If you exercise more, it doesn't mean it's better, okay, from, from this, this graph. Some if the walking, so maybe, maybe not, okay? So the 45 minute is the, the optimal. In another study also uh, mentioned that for walking, uh, low intensity physical exercise, okay? Daily uh, low intensity exercise one hours, okay? Continuously can delay brain aging for 1.4 years. If you're walking more than 7,500 steps, okay? Continuously can delay the brain aging around two years. So that's a lot, right? And also consistency, another study probably recently, okay? Showing that if you're walking over 10,000 steps a day, regardless of your step size, can significantly reduce your mortality rate, can lower all cause mortality, okay? Even exercise works, okay? So my take home message, as regular exercise is important because it is beneficial for improving hippocampal neuroplasticity that can improve your stress resilience, uh, promote your mood and cognitive functions. Okay, and most effective exercise duration for reducing mental health burden will be 45 minutes, three to five times a week. 
Uh, we don't like uh, doing exercise, walking will help, okay? Walking to over 700 to, or oh, missing a zero, it's 10,000 steps daily. It's neuroprotective and can significantly reduce all cause mortality, independent how uh, big you, your step is, okay? So, um, I would think little is better than none, okay? Go for a walk and then it's never too late to exercise. Even your age, 80s, 90s, our brain can change. We have, you still have the uh, plasticity, okay? To refine our neural circuitries. So there are different type of exercise, aerobic exercise, resistant exercise, and also my body exercise like Tai Chi, Qi Kong. If you don't like aerobic exercise, Tai Chi and Qi Kong is a good uh, exercise too. Because what we found is um, Qi Kong, Ba Ding Gam, okay, can increase the adiponectin in the blood too and reduce depression uh, symptoms. Okay, if you don't like exercise, you want something like effortless, uh, you don't need to, to contribute a lot to, to, for brain promotions. Uh, there's something you can do, it could be improve your brain function and listen to music. Okay, uh, any more studies showing that listen to Mozart Sonata, okay, for three weeks in the pups, they show increasing the BDNF level in the rat hippocampus. It's not proved in the humans, okay? So you might need to try it out, okay? So remember physical exercise is polypill that no single drug can replace exercise effect, particularly uh, its neuroprotective effect. So recommendation will be stay physically active, doing some more exercise to promote healthy aging. Okay, that's why I have my physical exercise and musical training in combination to improve my brain plasticity, to, to handle all the stress from work, to improve my brain capacity for doing um, research. Okay, it's me uh, playing the backpack for over 10 years and play the sonata tune, maybe have a bonus and enjoying the music, make my brain more plastic. Okay, so lastly, I would like to thank all my um, team members, especially my MPhil students. Thomas done a lot of work on Adiprovant Adip and also uh, Douglas now has finished his study and back to Brazil and AHA and Indivact. Also, my former lab member helped me to establish my lab since I joined PolyU in 2016. And also all my collaborators at PolyU uh, and Hong Kong U uh, in, in Guangzhou for transcendental research doing some clinical studies to test what how exercise work on the brain. And my international collaborator, um, my uh, super, former supervisor for postdoc the training, Brian Christie, and also Dr. Kirin Ren Plak, they are two uh, pioneers discovering how exercise promote neurogenesis and synaptic plasticity hippocampus. Also um, other um, collaborator from uh, McGill for doing some study on stress resilience. And also um, Professor Dillman uh, from Yale University, although he's not here uh, with us now. So um, his, his pioneer work on discovering the uh, mechanism of a rapid antidepressants have huge influence on my work. And then I, I visit his lab uh, for learning how to work on the neural pathway on, on antidepressant treatments. So I will continue his work to, um, um, as a tribute to his contributions. And also all my funding agency um, uh, throughout these years and UBSM for providing the facilities. Okay. Thank you so much. So I'm ready for Q&A sections. Thank you for the patience.